is it viable to flip 3D printers? Buy unloved machines with minor problems, fix them up and turn a profit. Today we explore this idea with an example machine. For every new person to 3D printing who continues with the hobby, there's probably another who faced an early hurdle and gave up. Their 3D printer is probably sitting collecting dust, with perhaps only a clogged nozzle or an uneven bed. So, if you were an experienced maker, could you turn a profit from buying these machines, fixing them up and selling them again? I thought it was an interesting idea, so I took on a test case. If you're a member of any 3D printing community groups, you might have seen some epic meltdowns from time to time. Angry people who just couldn't come to terms with 3D printing and had had enough. Most of the time, they're going to be new to the hobby and lacking fundamental knowledge. Sometimes these new users manage to overcome simple problems and get their machines going, and other times they don't know anywhere near as much as they think, and despite their epic rant blaming solely the hardware, their own ineptitude really isn't helping the problem. Some of these 3D printers might end up on sale. And in this example, the seller knows there's a problem and states that an experienced buyer might be able to fix it without issue. Other times, cheap 3D printers are for sale and the user doesn't necessarily know why it's not working. This one just wouldn't turn on despite being brand new. And this one is partially disassembled in a box, potentially working but with no guarantees. So just how much of a gamble are these machines? To find out, let's look at an example 3D printer. And this was not one that I purchased, in fact it was a review unit that I later gave away to a friend. As it came out of the box, this printer was in quite poor condition, and I needed to spend quite a bit of time repairing it, including soldering the mainboard, before I could even print. After I was finished however, it seemed to be a reliable machine and did produce some pretty nice prints. So when I heard from my friend that it wasn't working, I expected it just to be a minor problem that I could easily solve. And that's why I was so surprised when he dropped it off in such poor condition. I have no idea what this printer has done in a previous life to deserve this, but this thing was absolutely filthy and seems to have had a really hard life. Some of these problems were quite obvious, such as the Z offset being changed to a bizarre value and the hot end thermistor reading a high temperature despite not being turned on and being cool to touch. I had my suspicions as to what was wrong, probably a short making the thermistor read incorrectly and the Z level obviously needing fixing too. With this in mind, I formulated a plan of action. This list might be longer than what you're expecting, but they are logical steps. I would start by updating the firmware just to make sure there were no gremlins, then investigate and repair the hot end thermistor, go over the machine, tightening bolts and lubricating. I would then calibrate the Z offset make a simple slicer profile and complete some test prints to make sure everything was working. This is an obscure 3D printer, but previously I had compiled Marlin 1 and installed it onto the machine. These days Marlin 2 is the norm and there's example configurations for this printer on GitHub. So I created a new branch and copied over the configuration from GitHub, overriding the local generic Marlin files. I had one compilation error, which when I read it was really straightforward, the fix was as simple as disabling the speaker, and after that, the firmware compiled without issue. I then made some quality of life changes to suit this particular printer, including using the probe instead of a Z end stop, turning on the Z offset wizard, turning on baby stepping to easily tweak that offset while printing, and correcting the probe offset as I measured it with a ruler. The printer's mainboard is 8-bit, so I plugged in a USB cable and flashed the firmware from VS Code. Initialize the EEPROM when given the prompt and immediately notice that the hot end is still reading high despite not being turned on. So after checking that the machine could move and home correctly, it was time to move on to step two and investigate the thermistor. After disassembling the print head, I found what I expected to find, a tiny bit of exposed wiring for the thermistor. And rather than try and cover or repair this, I decided it was best to just solder in a new thermistor. Here's a new one prepped and ready to go, and here's some footage of the back of my hand as I solder it in place and apply some heat shrink. I actually rotated the whole hot end and applied a silicon sock to stop things from moving around so much. And following this, put everything back together, only to find the hot end thermistor was reading exactly as before. I flipped the machine up on its end, accessed the main board and unplugged the thermistor circuit. I also did the same for the bed thermistor 
and in both cases, temperatures were still red, around 250 for the hot end and 38 degrees for the bed. If they were still falsely reading with nothing plugged in, that could only mean one thing. This mainboard was toast. Let's update those steps then, because now we have to swap the mainboard for one that we know that works. In my case, I have a lot of spare mainboards, so in this instance, it won't cost me any extra to change it. In particular, I have a lot of spare mainboards intended for an Ender 3, and these just so happen to be the closest match in terms of the SD card and the USB port. So I took some measurements and modelled up this adapter. One of the old mounting lugs would actually touch the underside of the board, so I used a drill to lower its height. Crude, but effective. After cleaning up the shortened mounting boss, and vacuuming up all of the debris, I could slide the adapter into place, and use some screws on the original left hand bosses to prevent it from coming loose. Ender 3 main boards were now compatible with this Alta 4 3D printer. And most importantly, the SD card and USB port were fully accessible. Much of the wiring could simply be unplugged from the old board and plugged into the new one. However, some cables needed the positive and negative wires switched around to avoid letting out the magic smoke. And others needed light modification by crimping on ferrules to suit the screw terminals. But even so, overall the mainboard conversion was pretty painless. What was anything but painless was my saga fixing the LCD. This LCD interface, just like the printer, is a bit obscure. I knew from when I had previously compiled the firmware that it was an ANET full graphics LCD. But after poking through code in Marlin, examining pinouts for other ramps compatible mainboards, following random threads that Google brought me to, try as I might, I could never get the LCD to talk to the mainboard. My progress ultimately stopped when one of the PCB traces cracked and I wasn't able to repair it. Thinking I wanted a straight replacement to not alter the appearance of the machine from the front, I tried to order a replacement LCD, but ended up being scammed and sent this USB microphone instead, as covered in a recent video. So I started raiding my spares for different LCD screens to see what would fit best, and decided to use a Big Tree Tech TFT 35E3 mounted to the front of the machine, just like my patron Patrick did with his CR10S Pro. Shout out to Alexander Muntz, who posted this detailed model on GrabCAD. This made it really quick for me to make a simple two-part enclosure that bolted onto the front of the printer. Double check the screen works before drilling any holes in the case. Check the intended position for clearance before holding the new housing in position, marking the position of each hole, drilling them through properly, and bolting the housing for the LCD properly into place. Finally, the printer was functional and I could finish off my steps. The rest of the steps were fortunately relatively painless, and I had already vacuumed off most of the filth, but I gave it a top up anyway, and then worked my way around the machine, lubricating those poor Z lead screws, and making sure the fasteners were tight. Calibrating the Z offset was easy, because I had enabled the wizard for this in the firmware. Start the process, lower the nozzle down until the paper just catches, and then save your value, and Z offset is done. Around this time, I also updated the Big Tree Tech firmware on the TFT35. As I think for a novice, this touchscreen interface is a lot more intuitive and easier to navigate, with the bonus that they can now print from a thumbstick instead of a micro SD. I found further treasures, such as the filament inside the PTFE tube smashed up into many small pieces, and to top it off, some sort of epic clog on the top of the hot end, with my solution being to heat up a metal rod, use it to melt the stuck plastic at the top of the hot end, and pull out whatever this is. Then some cleaning filament to push through the rest of the gunk, before finally loading up some PLA and wondering exactly what horrible life this printer has lived. Onto a slicer profile, and it's actually pretty straightforward to copy over values from the firmware, and take my start and NG code from other printing profiles I already had. The exact settings can then be tweaked over the first few test prints, which finally brings us to our last step. I've set up ABL probing to take place before every print, it's slower this way but it should be more foolproof, and as a nice first layer finally went down, I actually had a huge sense of relief. This thing was finally alive and printing, after fighting me several steps along the way. During this first print, I corrected some of the optimistic acceleration values, and I also tested the filament runout detection was working, which is the big defect you see here. A humble print, but tremendous closure on the journey. You can see that the print improved from when I lowered the acceleration because that gave the part cooling much more of a chance to do an effective job. From this point, I went through my calibration website, 
PID auto tuning, calibrating e-steps, retraction, as well as linear advance. The printer had severe under extrusion that was cured by changing to a new nozzle, and these three benches best show the progress that was made during this tuning. We started with a detached print, stringing as well as bad part cooling, still some stringing, still bad part cooling, as well as some poor extrusion, and then finally, a quite respectable benchy, the only real problem being these blobs, where the printer seemed to stutter for just a moment. Not perfect, but a night and day improvement. I updated the slicing profile as I went, and exported the configuration to an IDI file, as well as a downloaded copy of the slicer. And to go with that, a step-by-step -step readme on installing the software, how to slice the average print job, how to change the filament, as well as starting and finishing print jobs. The aim being to make things foolproof and reduce the chances of this printer finding its way back to me again. And that's how it went with this particular 3D printer. It did have the little things that needed fixing, such as a clogged nozzle and a butchered bed level, but it unfortunately also had some larger issues like a busted mainboard. The truth is, if this didn't need to go back to a friend, I would have taken the loss and scrapped it for parts. And for me, that's the lesson with flipping 3D printers. Some machines are gonna go very smoothly for a profit, but others are gonna be more problematic, and it's the ratio between those two that will determine the viability, as well as how big your network of potential customers is. Let me know what you think about this idea in the comments, especially if you're someone who's already doing this successfully. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy potentially flipping 3D printers. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.